Patriotic to be outspoken. We are millions strong and we want another world. Don't give up. It's exciting to write books that I want to see in the world. This has been the most rigorous medication rollout this world has ever seen. Good, not prison. everyone. I'm Michelle Siquedos, president of the Campaign for College Opportunity, a California-based nonprofit organization that fights every day to make sure Californians can go to college and that once they get there, they're supported to graduate. I know there's many students in our audience today and many happy parents of students who have gone back to school. Um, so a back to school welcome to you and for all of the students getting ready to apply to college to those of you in college working to complete, we are cheering you on. I did want to give a special shout out to all our first generation college students. If you were a first generation college student, um, first in your family to go to college, give me a thumbs up in the chat. As a Chicana and a board member of the California Endowment, I got the lucky stick tonight and got to get to moderate this conversation with a hero of mine, legendary actor, activist, and art collector, Cheech Marin. Although I have to share that it's our board chair, Kurt Chilcott, who can recite Cheech and Chong albums by heart, and he did so at a recent board retreat. <laughs> And a good, meet, a good friend of mine, Manuel Pastor, a scholar at USC, sent me this message when he saw that I was moderating, moderating this conversation. He said, I don't often get jealous, but how cool. Yeah. So we're going to have a great night tonight. Um, but before we dive into our conversation, I want to remind everyone tuning in that this uh, webinar is being recorded. So you can watch it again. You can share the link, um, share it with friends. Uh, whenever you can. Also, before we begin, I just wanted to introduce Frida Bloom and Andrea Lust, who will be providing Spanish and American Sign Language interpretation services tonight. They have some instructions for us. Thank you, Michelle. In order to provide language access, this meeting will have simultaneous bidirectional interpretation into Spanish as well as American Sign Language. My name is Frida Bloom, and with my colleague Andrea Lust, who you see next to me now, we will provide interpretation. And if you wish to continue seeing Andrea in this uh, screen after the presentation, please click on the interpretation globe at the bottom of your screen and select American Sign Language. And now I'll explain how to enable the feature in Spanish. A efecto de proporcionar acceso lingüístico, esta reunión contará con interpretación simultánea al español. Si usted es bilingüe, no tiene que presionar nada. Pero si usted no es bilingüe y está en su computadora, en unos segundos verá un icono en forma de globo en la parte inferior de su pantalla. Haga clic en interpretación y después seleccione español o Spanish. Si este es su iPad o su teléfono, entonces busque el menú de tres puntos o que dice More en una de las esquinas de su pantalla. Haga clic en Interpretación y después seleccione Español o Spanish y después Aceptar, Finalizar o Done. Now, if the host can please sign us, we're ready to be begin. Thank you. Thank you so much, ladies. Okay, let's get going. Our guest tonight is an entertainment legend. He certainly needs no introduction, but we're going to do it anyway. He's uh, a winner of both Grammy and Alma Awards. I know we're gonna have a lot of laughs tonight, but we're also gonna explore the serious side of Cheech Marin, a man who's not only a talented actor, comedian, social justice advocate, but one of the most serious and influential collectors of Chicano art in the world. If you haven't been there already, please make plans to visit the Riverside Art Museum, home to the Cheech where an incredible collection of Chicano art from Chicha's collection is on display. So please welcome Chich Marin. Hi folks, ¿cómo están ustedes? 
the chat is already uh, popping. I can tell our audience is excited to start. So thank you to everyone who shared questions in advance. We have a packed agenda, a lot of great questions, and we're gonna try to get to as many as them as possible. Uh, Cheech, let's start with, you know, you're a lifelong art lover. As a child, you checked out every book out of the library on all the great painters from the old masters to modern artists. Where did that passion come from? Uh, it was an assignment, actually. <laughs> when I was, I guess I was around 10, I had the, these cousins. There was there was four of us all together, and I was the youngest one. And the head cousin, Louie, who has since passed on, it was a bright, really bright guy. And, 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 and he decided that he was going to assign us topics to learn about, to, you know, like AP classes. This was back there in the olden days. And, uh, and I got assigned art. And so how do you learn about art? I don't know. You go to the library. So I used to go to the library and uh, every Saturday and then and try to check. I, they wouldn't let me check out the, the, the good art books because I was too young. And But they would bring them in front of me and with white gloves. They would turn the pages for me. And that's how I learned about art. And every Saturday, they knew I was going to come be there at 10 o'clock in the morning. And when the library opened up and, and that way, I, I had a, a great uh, education in Western art for the most part, some Eastern, but mostly Western art. You know, so when I and, and but coincident with that is I used to go to museums at this time. I, I habit picked up that habit because uh, paintings have to be seen in person. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you can see them in reproduction, but uh, but there's nothing like seeing a painting in person and it's, it's different than what you expect um so i kept doing that and doing that and doing that and then one day i i got uh, uh endowed enough <laughs> to be able to buy start buying art and at that time around that time I, I that's when i discovered for me the chicano painters of la so before we get to the chicano painters was there like a first favorite artist oh of any artist yeah what was your who was your first favorite artist or painting i i like caravaggio you know because he invented basically chiaroscuro which is like half dark half light you know and he and he was a wild character wild wild painter he was very uh i don't know uh, I don't know, maybe uh, good, maybe bad. I don't know what, what his deal was, but he was very controversial at that time. But I just loved his paintings and his ability to paint. That's what I always looked for. Not only, you know, the the, the first uh, impression when you see a painting, but after a while, you know, if you study, you, you zone in on the details of how how they're painted you know that technique and that's something that chicanos uh never gave up mexicans as well that they never gave up the brush you know they didn't go through all these kind of get your assistant to do it fa phases uh they all did it so they're all master technicians and that and you can see it in, in the work they produce did you ever paint yourself i know that you gravitated toward pottery so i'm interested in learning about that yeah. well i know i never painted i was i was dissuaded let's say from from making that kind of art and, and like in the second grade or first grade and and on my school we went to the grand central market and everything that grows upon the earth was in that market and it was and i was always the littlest kid in every class up until college i was the littlest kid and and so when we got back to the classroom the teacher said well i want everybody to draw a picture of the thing that impressed them the most in this market and it was like you know, how do you do that and so I, I i saw these banana squashes these big and they were bigger than me you know like oh god and i'm gonna get my my orange crayons on it maybe a little bit of yellow and i made these big banana squashes and little stick figure me next to it and i was so proud of that you know that i actually had made a picture and the teacher was coming around checking everybody's work she finally got to mine she goes it looks at it goes well you'll never be an artist and it was Ouch. like I mean, it was like a dagger to my heart, you know, I'm like, oh, man, I just, so I just crawled away in the corner and let my artistic soul die there in the dark, I guess. But I knew I was an artist of some kind. I always knew that, you know, and I, but I just didn't have a, a medium. And until I got to uh, a, a, a college and I and my very last semester, I took a pottery class because uh, this real cute girl next to me was going to take it. She says, why don't you take this class with me? I said, well, I, I could be talked into that. <laughs> and once I got my hands on clay and centered my first piece of clay, that was it. 
that was that was gonna what I was gonna be doing for the rest of my life. I thought so at that time, and I quit all my classes. I, I quit my job, got a nine hundred dollar NADA loan, and lived on that, and made pottery from the time I get up, got up to the time I, I went to sleep every day. And so it was like I was obsessed, and uh, that led to other stuff. Do you still do pottery? No, you know, I wish I did, but it's it's a a, a very tedious, multi leveled process, and you have to kind of be there. And I'm never here. <laughs> I'm traveling all the time. I wish yeah. I could. I wish I maybe I will. You know, set aside a time. I had a kiln in the house and had a wheel and everything, but I never got to it because I was always traveling. But it was it was a, it was a really important turning point in my life. I love it. Um, well, hopefully we'll see a, a Cheech Marin uh, pottery exhibit at the Cheech. You never know because there's a lot of painters that that make pottery. I mean, Chicano yeah. painters. And I'm, I'm I'm thinking about curating a show of their potteries, uh, a pottery that they do. And I, I think it will be a real eye opener for everybody that just, you know, yeah. uh, puts everybody in a, in a certain category. It's like, you know, being able to uh, uh, sing and play basketball at the same time, you know? Yeah. I love it. Okay, so I wanted to ask you about um, leaving the United States for Canada in the early 70s. Uh, You did that to continue to work as a potter and to avoid being drafted and sent to Vietnam. Can Mm. you talk about that decision? Was it difficult or easy? Uh, No, it wasn't, you know, because I knew that I wanted to be a potter and anything that aided that direction but also in my very last semester in in, in school i i uh, i was part of the draft resistance movement under david harris and i and he, a bunch of speakers came through the school i was a valley state it was now cal state northridge and they were all influential eldridge cleaver uh uh reyes tierina uh, timothy wow. leary but david harris came through and he he gave a speech that really made sense you know it was the universal soldier speech that you know we can't have a war if they don't have any soldiers and if you pr- mm-hmm. refuse to participate in the war that's how you stop the war not by uh, other means and so i said that sounds really really good to me and it sounds logical and 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 uh and say and he was a very compelling speaker not very you know forceful he was very quiet and that's what drew me in and so i i, I turned in my draft card to this thing and they went on on to a, a, a collage that accompanied david harris and john Baez, his then wife uh on a speaking tour across the u.s and if you and it was on the cover of newsweek magazine and if you look really closely in the corner you can see my my draft card there and so, you know, and the die was cast. But at the same time, my my pottery teacher, who who knew what I was doing, uh, said he had this uh, ex student in Canada that was starting a pottery. Maybe he needed an assistant, and that's all I needed. You know, I I took my last eighty bucks that I had in the world and bought a ticket um, and rode the dog to. Uh, to Calgary, you know, wow. it was exactly opposite of what I thought Calgary was going to look like. I thought it was going to be Sergeant Preston and and a dog sled, you know. It looked like Bakersfield, you know. And, <laughs> uh, but then I spent the I, and so I I worked for this potter, and then when he got his studio started, he couldn't afford to hire me because I, you know, he was just starting out. But there was this other potter that lived nearby, and he was very famous. His name was Ed Drahanchuk. And he said, well, he said the same thing. Well, maybe he needs an assistant. And that's all I needed. I got on my boots and walked the 11 miles up to his his studio in, in the next town. And I, and I kept talking. And he looked at me like I was from outer space, you know, because I, I walked up his driveway and I started talking till he till he hired me right then. And he, and he said, well, when can you start? I said, I can start right now. He says, okay, go, go clean off those bricks, that pile of bricks, go clean them off. And then, okay, you're hired. And that was it. And it was the, the purest time of my wow. life. It was just unbelievable. Okay. And that's where you met your comedy partner, Tommy Chong. In Canada, uh, but in Vancouver. Because I lived in Canada for three years. And one year in, in Bragg Creek, where I was, a little town. One year in Banff, which was a, nas- it's a national park. And while it was the Canadian Rockies. And then one year in Vancouver. And that's where I met Tommy in Vancouver. I love it. So... One of the stories I read is that, you know, you really started to kind of hone your act and then you came back to the to the States and uh, you landed an open mic night at the Troubadour yeah. legendary club on L.A. Sunset Strip. Uh-huh. So share that story with us. How'd you how'd you get that gig? 
Well, you, <laughs> you signed up for it. They have this policy that on Monday nights or Mondays, it was called Hootenanny Night. And the, and the first six acts that were lined up at the box office when it opened at six got to go on that night in reverse order. So the first ones there got to go on sixth that night, which was a good spot because everybody had come in already and they ordered their drinks and they said hi to the friends and about the sixth person they were they were ready to listen and yeah. that was us and so we'd, we'd line up in front of the uh, box office at nine o'clock in the morning on monday and sit there all day until it until it uh, uh op- the box office opened and, and we got on and we did that a bunch of times it wasn't just one time we, you know we were, yeah. we were persistent but we started uh, uh, f- gathering a following and people now was appreciated that we were going to be there on Monday. And so they started at calling and asked, oh, is Chi Chin Chong going to be there? And like, you know, so, and that, that all of a sudden happened very rapidly. And we met uh, Lou Adler, who was our record producer at the time. And, and, and he, and he was from East LA. He was from Boyle Heights. And so he recognized what we were doing right away. And he seemed uh, sent a message to us that we should come and see him the next day. And Tommy didn't know who he was uh, 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 because he wasn't in Motown, <laughs> which was Tommy was from. And, uh, and, uh, but I did. And so uh, he was the biggest record producer in the world at that time. Yeah. And we, we came over and met him and he listened to us and says, well, what do you guys want to do? And so he says, and I looked around his office, there's nothing but gold records everywhere on the ceiling, on the floor. And he says, well, I make a record, I guess. It's what you do. <laughs> and so he says, well, what kind? I said, uh, I want to make a gold record. You seem to be able to make those. <laughs> you know, so, <clears throat> so I said, okay. And he had no, you know, how are you going to do this? You know, well, how do you, how do you record these guys and blah, blah, blah. And so we went into the studio the first time and we kind of acted out one of the, one of the scenes we were playing and it was, it was okay. And everybody kind of goes, well, that was okay. And, and Lou says, well, you guys go in the studio and, and figure it out. And that's what we did. We went into a little, little mix down room and it was only two guys and two microphones. And we started working on how to do this, how to convert our stage act as much as we could into a record, into an audio act. Into it had to sound funny, not look funny. Ah, you know? I love that. And so that's what we we proceeded to do that. And all our contemporaries at the time, Lily Tom and George Carlin, Richard Pryor, their comedy records consisted of a recording of their live act. You know, we were totally different. We went in the studio and created these scenes. There was no audience. It was just sound effects, which was great. I mean, and it was great in the era era of. Uh, 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 air, earphones because everybody was into the you know the mix and panning and they were really listening to that and and so that's what we we started getting this audience vis-a-vis that wow so you're you really were well prepared for all of these voiceover characters that you ended up doing later in life that's mm-hmm. how you really got started Exactly. That's exactly how it happened. You know, we kind of like, okay, we, I mean, and we, and we came out of improv. It was, it was naked improv, but it was improv nonetheless, because the where I met Tommy was in this, in this bar. It was, it was actually Vancouver's first topless bar that his parents owned, and they had turned it into a topless bar while he was on the road, too. See, that's what happens when you go on the road. And uh, they came back, and he turned it, and he'd seen improv theater. When he was on the road with Motown, uh, he saw a second city in Chicago and the committee in San Francisco. And he decided in his farsightedness that that was what he wanted to do now. He was not a guitar player anymore in R&B. He was going to be a, a improv actor. And so I got wind of this I, and I gave him this big resume when we met. I was this great improv actor, writer, you know, you're writing improv sir, uh, from L.A. and blah, blah, blah. And he hired me as, an, as a writer. So I started writing for the group. That's awesome. Um, what is your favorite voiceover character that you've played? I, I'll share. I loved, loved you in so many, but definitely the hyena and the Lion King, probably because I watched that more than 20 times, uh, I, you know, every week with my kids. Oh, God. That, I mean, it was a it was a groundbreaking movie. 
I mean, I, you know, when they first presented, it was the second Disney movie I ever made. And the first one, Oliver and Company, remains one of my favorites because, I mean, I just give this full-throated performance. You know, because when I, when, they, when I went to audition for it, because I'd never auditioned for anything. We were just our own self-contained entity. And I went to audition. They called me in. And they gave me the script, and I went into the thing and, and read it, and, and, I, and I sort of read it, and, and then they go, "Well, yeah, well, that was that was good. Okay, thanks very much for coming." Uh, and and so I got up to the parking lot, and I go, "Boy, that sucked. That was I I, I ter- terrible." And I, I'm going to go do it again. So I went back to the studio, and knocked on the door, and said, "Listen, I I, I don't think that was really good. I'd like to do it again." I go, well, okay. And George Scribner, who was the director, it was very fortunate in that he was, he spoke Spanish because he lived in Panama for many years. And so I, he kind of got an essence of the character. And, and, and I said, do you have any direction for me on this? And he says, play it like you got your finger stuck in a light socket. And I go, you got it. <laughs> and I just. You right knew from- what that felt like. It felt like be as fast and as loud as you can and like you're getting shot, you know. That's the only reaction you want to have. You want to is like full 100% all the time, you know. And and everybody woke up in the studio. They started drawing me, stuff like that. And, and they could see it change in, in the studio where they were. And, and I go, oh, and, but it wore my throat out. I mean, it was frazzled. And they say, okay, uh, well, the next session will be on Tuesday. You got to be here at 10 o'clock. And I go, I got the guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, be here at ten o'clock. You know, and so I was on that film for another year and a half because they kept expanding my part, and then other characters that had come in and they, they you didn't know how to give a, a an animated performance for like in the rock and roll era, you know, because that was you know something they weren't used to. And Bette Midler was uh, uh, the played the female lead, and uh, and she was my 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 active partner there, and she came in and heard it and said, "I want to do it again too." <laughs> so we're gonna do the whole damn movie again, and so and so every it energized the whole thing, and it was a, a fantastic movie. And then I love it. And then, and then I made Lion King and Cars and everyone after that, you know. Yeah. Was, but but all the 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 record training doing the voices was training for animation. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I love I I love learning that about you. Mm-hmm. Um. So you mentioned Lou, you know, you and Tommy really did find um, your first real success in LA's Black nightclub scene. Do you have theories about why that happened? Why did Black audience embrace Cheech and Chong so quickly? Well, we were talking about weed, which was, you know, a common, <laughs> a common thing. You know? and, and we both grew up in Black culture. I blew, I grew up half in South Central LA, all black, and then half in Granada Hills, all white. You know, but equally, but I, you know, I we understood, I understood, and he understood black culture very well. So when we were talking, and then we were talking in their language, you know, because we were improv and we see what they were reacting to, how they how they came in and laughed. What are the big getting the biggest laugh. And so we had a wealth of information. You know, we we spoke that language of that neighborhood. And so that was, you know, fortunate. And so there was a lot of black clubs in L.A. That, and, and also more black clubs that I didn't even know about. But Tommy knew knew from his uh, Motown days. And so we went from club to club, club and we started gathering this this black following in L.A. And they, they started to know who we were. And we were these crazy, two crazy hippie guys, you know, and I think one's a Chicano. And I don't know what the other guy is. Looks like Mongolian, you know. And uh, and we started. And but on Monday nights, we would play at the white club at the Troubadour. You know, so but that's where you could get a record deal. You're going to get no record deal with the black clothes, you know. And so we met Lou and, you know, the rest was history. Well, and um, incredible, right, talent to navigate all the different uh, cultures, environments, uh, and make sure that your humor works, right, in all those ways. You know, it was great in that era because everybody was getting together, you know, those those boundaries were, were starting to be erased, and Blacks mixing with Whites, with mixing with Chicano, mixing with Asian, mixing with hippies, whatever they, whatever they were, you know, at that time. Yeah. And so there was a lot of intermingling, you know, so and so it was really wide open. So we we took full advantage of that. So what do you um, 
feel you've learned from that experience and others about black and brown coalition building more broadly? Anything that you would say uh, is a big takeaway and relevant today? Well, you know, it was you find that black and brown neighborhoods are often side by side and and, and intermingle with, you know, uh, so they understand a little bit about each other's culture, you know, so because they are exposed to it every day. And so when we get out, when we got out there, I mean, our our favorite music was R&B. You know, we were a big R&B B guys. And then now the hippie music was coming in, you know, Crosby, Stills and Nash and Joni Mitchell. And I, I dug those guys because I was a, like a single guitar player and I, you know, did folk music. And, and uh, so we mixed all those together, you know, and it was and everybody was doing the same thing in the audience. They were listening to James Brown and Joni Mitchell at the same time. That's why. Prince was a big Joni Mitchell fan, I mean, and he, but he was doing R and B too as well. So those those things mixed together very well for us, and 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 there was a comedy and music that was produced out of that that really kind of resonated. Everybody's oh, that's a great mix, you know. I love it. So Nikita and Rosita asked this question. She notes that as a comedian, you openly talked about cannabis use when it was taboo and illegal. She asked what you think of the evolution of the industry. Are you surprised that we're at a time where it's legal, pot shops on every corner? Yeah, I'm not surprised at all. I'm The only surprise is that it took so long, you know? I mean, they're like, because everybody was doing it and, and the more everybody was doing it. And, and like the next generation, which it wasn't even a generation is like, uh, the the next high school class was totally out in the open in L.A. You know, uh, they were the total. Hey, you got any dope? Yeah, here's some over here. Man. You know, it was like that. That fear was gone, and then, and they were and the cops or any of those entities were being overwhelmed. You know, you can't arrest ten thousand people a day. Uh, they can try, but they but they but they didn't. So it was much more open, and it was getting the only thing that I'm surprised that never happened or hasn't happened yet. I'm sure it will is to have it federally legal. And to take be taken off schedule one, you know, because it's it's yeah. in some categories heroin and cocaine and you know and and uh, it's weed. <laughs> right, right. Okay, so um, after Cheech and Chong hits, you created the song "Born in East LA" and followed that up with a feature film based on the song. It's your first directing credit. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about the inspiration behind "Born in East LA"? Well, you know, I, I, I came back from, I mean, I'd been living in Paris during that time. I think we were there. He was there longer. I was there for about a year and a half, I guess. And we were having a great time. And, but we were, we were, there was tension among us. So we, we started to separate at that, at that time. Mm -hmm. And I came back to LA and I was like, you oh, know, my, my group's broken up. I was going through a divorce and I was really depressed. And I, I came back to LA and would just smoke weed and play guitar and look at the ocean. And it was at the same time that MTV was invented. And I, I started looking at the, the these things that were like music and filming. And I go, this is perfect for us. We're, we're musicians and we're also filmmakers. Perfect. We'll make, make a video album, you know, and then people can buy that. And, be, and so and we, there's a song element involved. There's acting, there's you know, filmmaking. And so I, I started writing these these videos, you know, and trying to make up new songs and stuff. And uh, eventually, I, I told I was all excited. I I told Tommy about. It. I called him up and, and yeah, well, we got uh, that over here, but I don't know. Well, just we'll just come over and we'll you know. So he finally came over and and recorded one or two tracks on the album, and then he split. It. He didn't want to do it. So okay. Well, I did. <laughs> you know, I saw I saw that this was this was a way for us. And then at the end of the I had need one more. I needed one more song for the album. And I was sitting at my kitchen table. And I was reading the newspaper, having coffee, and I was reading the story about a kid in L.A. and he was like twelve, thirteen, and, and I think he had some kind of uh, developmental. Uh, problems and didn't speak English that well or Spanish. So he got caught in an immigration raid and they thought he was Mexican and they deported him. He was like 12, 13 years old. So, and he didn't know where he was and he was wandering wow. around the streets of, of uh, Tijuana for a month before his parents could finally track down what he was, where he was. And, 
And and I'm reading this, and at the same time that Bruce Springsteen song was playing on the radio, "Born in the USA," so I started singing along with it. "Born in East LA," <laughs> too bad for that guy, you know. And and so I go, "That's it. That's the song." All right, I got to find out what the real words are because I didn't. All I remember is Bruce Springsteen. Everyone once in a while yeah. said, "Born in the USA," and then the rest of that, yeah. And so I got the album, came back, and started writing this song. And then we had we had to record the song first, and then that got a lot of attention, and uh, we made a a, a, an al- a video out of it, a whole video album, and then uh, then the, then got the offer for the movie. So what's amazing about Born in East LA is that it's you know it's really a searing critique, obviously of of immigration and how it works and and how people are treated. And yet you had so much laugh out loud, you know, moments you. with your, with your comedy, you know, the movie is more than 30 years old. Um, there's so much that's still relevant today, right? You have a, the governor of Texas sending buses full of migrants uh, to other states, including 13 to LA alone. Um, what would you say has changed or not changed if you were working on Born in East LA today? I would call it born again in East LA. <laughs> I think, you know, it was a real odd time. You know, there was a, it was very uh, uh, separated. It was starting to get a lot of separation between a lot of groups and blah, blah, blah. And people just, uh, you know, they were starting to get, get roughed up a little bit. And, uh, and so, uh, but, but it was easy to, to make fun because, there was funny elements in it, you know, I mean, here you find yourself in this situation and that had music in it. It was a song, you know, that was actually born and still lay went to the top of the charts. It was a number one hit song on, on, the, on, ra- on AM radio, which was unheard of for comedians to have that, you know, so, so it, it, it just hit the audience right at, at the right time. And, and it was, it was relevant. Absolutely. It was, and it was, and it was, it, extremely relevant and you got to talk about it just like all comedians do throughout the ages under the cloak of 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 a joke you know charlie chaplin was the same way yeah he had big issues and uh and that's kind of the 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 uh the area that we saw ourselves into you know without drawing attention or saying anything about it it was obvious obviously yeah. relevant. yeah yeah i love that um so as a proud Chicana, I've always loved that you've proudly identified as a Chicano. What does that mean to you? I didn't learn. I was a Chicana until I went to college. Yeah. Uh, that's when I, uh, then I, I became a Chicano fairly early because I didn't, you know, I, I lived in an all black neighborhood. So I was like, yo, Mexican, you know, <laughs> and everybody referred to me. And I said, well, I'm not Mexican. I never even been to Mexico. I don't speak Spanish. So I'm, I'm something else, but I, it's not, I'm not Mexican, but I'm Mexican roots, you know? So like, and yeah. so I came, came home to dinner one night and they were having a big family dinner. And my uncle Rudy, who was actually a policeman too, with my father, my father was LAPD. And um, he was telling this story over dinner. He says he went to get his car repaired. And, the, and he said, no, no, guy wanted two hundred dollars to fix that he says hey man give me a pair of pliers and a piece of tin foil i'll fix it said i'm a chicano mechanic that's what i am that's what i am i'm that guy i'm the guy guy who can do anything and i don't have to you know have the right tools or a lot of money i can i can make it up i can be rasquatch as much as i want man that's <laughs> who i am and from that day forward i identify with being a chicano i love that yeah. So when did you first become interested in collecting Chicano art? I think you were going to tell us about the yeah. first piece you bought. Um, I fell in love with Chicano art as soon as I saw it, mm. because I understood what they were doing, yeah. because I was educated in classical art, and I was a Chicano, and I saw how those they put those elements together, you know, uh, you saw the underpinnings of, of their of their narrative and plus added the, the Chicano elements having like a little one room shack with a 37 room apartment on it <laughs> as, as, as Chicano, man, Rascuache, you know, and. And I go, this is this is cool and because there was a lot of other artists kind of doing that same mix at the time, you know. Red Grooms uh, was a, was a favorite one of mine, and I, we're doing a Chicano, you know, version of that, uh, and 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 it's and it's and it's 
are, are, it's landing with the audience. They got it. You know, we, even from the records and the movies, we got it. And so when I started collecting Chicano art, it, it, they were still being referred to as uh, agitprop folk artists, oh. you know. And I and I told all the artists, well, this that, in, in the museum world, they think you're agitprop folk artists. And they all had the same reaction. What's an agitprop folk artist? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, they're making that shit up. Uh, so, you know, I, 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 I understood what they were doing. I said, just keep doing what you're doing, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and in those days, once you know one uh, Chicano artist, then next day, you know, 20 because, oh, there's somebody buying <laughs> on hey, you. I'll That's show up. I started collecting. I was, I was a perfect storm. I knew what the art was. Yeah. I had the money to collect it and I had notoriety in order to proselytize for it, you know, yeah. and it started oh, cool, you know, and, and those getting in the museum world was a tough deal, you know, because it's the final imprimatur of cultural acceptance. You know, if a museum is showing it, then it's got to be legit, you know, and nobody wanted to do that. None of the, the museum directors, it was like putting your head in the block. You know, and and but for me, I didn't I wasn't a college professor in Chicano studies. You know, I didn't have unpaid student loans. And, you know, uh, I was just this this doper comedian. And they liked me as a doper comedian, but they weren't so sure about me as, as you know, spokesman for Chicano art until they started opening the crates. And that's when it changed. You know, they, oh, these are cool, man. These are, this is the real stuff. It's like eating a really good Mexican restaurant in, you know, Sheboygan or something like that. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't belong in here, but it does belong in here is the real stuff. And so once, the, once you got one museum, the rest of them followed. The next one was the Smithsonian. And, and in every single museum, we played, I think, 14 museums in seven years. Major museums we do two years, wow. and I uh, and it was a, it was it was a huge hit, and it caused enormous opening of doors that had never been opened before. You know, everybody was proud of it. Now it was now it was legit. You know, and now we could start building the foundation of it. So I I just kept collecting, and then after we finished that one show, I I subdivided the the collection into smaller categories: you know, works on paper, works by women, works from California foreign texas artist you know and i could play other museums that didn't have such a long lead time to get in you know to get into the smithsonian that's a five-year wait even yeah. if they want you you know uh, and so but it's other museums you, you could get it right in right right away and they were seeing they were going to see stuff that even the big museums didn't see you know and they're they're equally valuable i still love little paintings you know they're so concise and 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 artistic in their in their approach and so i started doing that eventually uh, i wound up doing a show uh, a small show it works on paper at the riverside art museum yeah and it was the biggest show they ever had attendance wise and they they had this building which the museum sits in now and it was the town library but it's a beautiful mid-century building beautiful yeah and and they had this plan for me to give them the collection and they would house it there and they'd give me the museum basically for it. And, you know, you, I spent a long time putting this and money, putting this collection together. And, and it's one of those kind of intuitive decisions that you have to make if you've, if you've honed your, uh, your, your response time, you know, and, and okay. Yeah, I just said, okay, let's see what happens. And here you go. So that's how you ended up at Riverside. Yeah, they came to me, yeah. which is unheard of, which is unheard of. I'm I can't emphasize how much that is unheard of because I know a lot of bigger collectors now, big collectors have collections of different stuff, you know, and and for them to get in a museum, especially a minority group, like as a, uh, a friend lives across the street, has a big uh, African-American collection. And he says, I just, you know, they just, you know, because I don't have I don't have a, a provenance in that in that field. I'm a, I work yeah. for Alcoa, you know, or something. And and so I started. Did you ever imagine you would have a museum? No, no, 
No. I know. I say because and people would tell me uh, uh, all the time. They said, "Well, you should have your own museum." You know, I said I should have a jet plane too, but I don't got one of those. You know, so, <laughs> so you hadn't thought about it until Riverside came to you. No, I hadn't thought. I no, I dismissed it. It's, had, it's not that I hadn't thought about it. Yeah, that's just beyond the realm of possibilities. And I, you know, museums are very expensive. And I, you yeah. know. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm doing OK, but I don't know if I'm museum rich, you know. And no, they came to me and it's like, what? And, and, and when you go in business with a city, it's a whole different ballgame, you know, yes. and you get you get access to much bigger uh, loans or much bigger uh, grants. And the state can help you out. But if you're one little little vata by himself with, with a painting on his arm, you know, keep pedaling, dude, you know, because <laughs> it's, yeah. tough, it's a tough road, you know. And it's, and museums are highly political institutions. I don't care what museum. They're highly political institutions, not only as seen from the outside world, but inside the museum. It's, it's a mm -hmm. highly political situation. So Carlos in the Inland Empire asked um, the following. He says, after visiting the Cheech, I was struck by the variety of styles and mediums on display. Can you speak to what draws you to a particular artist or a, or a particular work of art? You know, it's your intuition, it's your education that you've been doing it for a long time. And you and you get yourself to the point where you can recognize good art. You know, it's really obvious when you stand in front of a paint because your your reaction is filtered down to, wow. But that wow is informed by a whole history. You've been studying this for half your life, you know. I mean, more than half your life at that time. And uh, so you, I mean, you have to have intuition to recognize that. And if you do, you know, that's a lucky thing that, that you can. And so it, it all were, it, all the points were, were, were coming together at the same time. And I kind of felt that that was happening. It was like, you know, in the Wizard of Oz, where the house is falling from the sky and it's twirling down, and I thought it's going to fall on me if I just stand on this X. It's just stand on this X, and the house is going to fall on me, and that's what happened. I love it. Um, well, we're getting lots of love for you from viewers in Riverside, so I think a lot of people are happy that you help build this beautiful Chicano temple, and I'm definitely uh, excited about it. I've been there several times. Um, it's beautiful, isn't it? I mean, it it's really is beautiful. beautiful. And and to your point of seeing it, you know, the, the one of my favorite pieces that you have is the the piece that's the cover to the Los Lobos album, which I think a lot of us have that print. Yeah, but to yeah. See it in person, and it's um, the size. I did not imagine how large it was. What a beautiful piece. Well, um, it, the original painting was not that size it was a small painting it was oh, maybe okay. maybe 16 inches by 12 inches yeah it was, it was a small and and the actor sean penn owned it he had he had bought it from yepes and okay. somehow his trailer wherever that was caught on fire burned down and the painting was lost oh, no. the original painting so so when we got ready to do the show i wanted that image in in the show so i went to George Epis, and I said, hey, make me another one of those, but big, because we're going to be a big museum show. And whatever st style you're working in right now, because, you know, styles evolve and, and change, and, and, and we'll put it in the show. And it was a huge hit. So wow. yay, yay co coincidence. And I love the one right across that, also from Yepes, the the Virgen, the Chicana wow. Virgen, I like to call Isn't that. Isn't that nice? I mean, there's, there's a, he's a really good painter, and he's really good. And, and he runs a school to teach kids how to do murals, you know, which is is really valuable in the, in the community. Because, you know, where where is your chance? Where is going to be your chance to learn that, you know? Yeah. They don't have mural schools, as far as I know. So do you have a favorite or is that like asking a mom who her favorite child is? It's the kid that's not bugging you at the time. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's the artist and that's but no, no, I don't have a favorite because it changes all the time. You know, the thing that somebody remarked earlier, there was so many different styles and they came because it's the Chicano school is not based upon style. It's based upon description of culture. Yeah. Mm -hmm that they'd be the most public 
moments in our culture, fighting for our rights out in the street, battling with it, or the most intimate moments, the love between a mother and a child, or you and, and your brothers or sisters, you know, it's very, <clears throat> it's very small, and it's very large at the same time. And it's informed by world art, you know, once you start seeing it, then you see it. But you don't, you don't because you don't expect it, and you don't expect it from this group of artists. There were these Chicano artists that were, you know, had prop folk art. You know, uh, once you start seeing, it, then you can't unsee it. You know? Yeah, that's also true. And somebody in the chat I just caught um, talked about the Narciso Martinez exhibit, um, the farm worker uh, turned MFA. Have you seen his work? What's his name? Narciso Martinez. Amazing. There's a great no, article in the LA Times. Um, and he uses the the materials that farm workers use in the fields to create art. So uh oh. thank you, MV, for, for sharing that point. Um, I know you hosted Bill Gates recently at um the Cheech. How was that? It was cool. It was really cool, you know, because he's his his and Melinda Gates Foundation, which is separate from either of their private foundations, was going to do a lot of work in the Inland Empire that year, and they had people working for them, and they they met me, and he they introduced the uh, the museum to Bill Gates, and said, you got to see this. this is this is good. So okay, and then Bob he he could only see three paintings, you know, because he's real busy because he's Bill Gates. Okay, I get it. <laughs> Yeah. And and so it was like, and he had a whole entourage of people. So he finally shows up, and he shake has to come on. And we couldn't get him out of the museum. I mean, he said he saw everything. He stayed there for a long time, and I took him to the whole thing. And there was there was one person. I don't I, I don't think he'd mind me telling this, but there was one in moment we was we were standing in front of a painting by Benito Huerta, and it was uh, uh, it was half Picasso, Las Damas de Avignon, and half a lead sheet. And it's a big painting, you know, and I'm and I'm telling, I'm explaining to Bill with, with this thing. And it was it was a Chicano version of these these prostitutes are not Parisian prostitutes, they're Juarez prostitutes, and 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 the style that he paints. And because Picasso said art is everything, and Kandinsky said art is nothing. So he wanted to combine those two, uh, two, two views in, in one painting. So the other side of it was a lead shield, weighs 250 something pounds. And, and I said, but the really, and he's standing right next to me and, he, and he's listening to this narrative. And I said, but the really remarkable thing is about the, the Picasso side. It's, it's painted on velvet and he listens and he, and he reaches out his hand and start, and he's going to, and then he gets about an inch away from and he realizes he's not in his house, you know, <laughs> and he draws <laughs> his hand. Out and go, yeah. <laughs> but it was a really cool moment because I was, and I don't know if he was like really drawn by the, which he was drawn by the painting or he was drawn by the narrative, you know, but it was, yeah. it was compelling him to, to touch that painting, you know, to find Did out. Did he try what to buy anything was. from you? Maybe that piece? No. No, 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 no. Uh, well, we were not supposed to ask him about money. That's 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 good. I, I oh, appreciate okay. that. So whatever uh, happens in the future happens. Right. Okay. That may that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. So, oh my gosh, I know um we are in the last 10 minutes mm -hmm. and there's so many questions I want to ask you. Go ahead. Uh, any any um what's up next for the Cheech? Um, you know, we're going to keep stuff. We just did our first turnover, our first edition. We thought that we would like put the show up for six months and then change it out. But we found that uh, there were so many advanced reservations for the show uh, that we couldn't we couldn't change it because everybody was coming in to see paintings that they heard of and seen. And, you know, you, don't, you want to arrive and see those paintings. So we kept the first show up for a year. And still they were so, so we can't, we came to the decision that we can't turn over the whole show. We'll turn over maybe 50, 60 pieces at a time. So, yeah. and, but so the, your favorites will always be there. Uh, but new stuff, we kept doing new stuff and own oh, And then I think the second, second show is really, really strong and really, really great. And then you get to, you get to introduce a lot more artists, you know, and so we were we're hewing to that uh, that narrative right now, and we'll see what happens. But uh, we have an upstairs show. You went upstairs. Uh, but who did yeah. you see the Delatore show? Um, I saw the one you had for the gala opening. It was all the the glass, right? The, yeah, the yeah. 
the De La Tons. Yes, and then yeah. recently you had a different show. Yeah, well, that show was we we take traveling shows that are coming around. So now all these Chicano shows that don't have a place to go have a place to go. And that's you know, a great space. Yeah, I, yeah. It's, it's that's a, a full museum of, space up there. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. I mean, this yeah, I, love it. I can't believe it. You know, it's it's it's, it's, it's this thing that there's the museum that fell from the skies. You know. Aww. Thank you. Well, thank you for collecting and, and, the incredible and, art that made that museum possible, Cheech. It, it it was it was it was it is incredible art. It was a, and it's and there's a lot of different styles because it's not based on style. It's based right. upon interpretation and observation of culture. Yeah. So, did you see the Blue Beetle movie? No, I haven't yet. Oh, so did you know that you have a cameo in there? I'll I'll wait for the check to clear. <laughs> no, no, I don't. But then George is in there, yeah. George is in there, and George yeah. drives this incredible, uh, you know, souped-up truck, and yeah. he has Cheech and Chong bobbleheads. And ah. I, guess, I just wanted to know if where do I get my Cheech and Chong bobbleheads? Oh, they're around. You can go buy them. I just oh, go okay, good, and good, find good. out find out where they are. Yeah. Uh, I was good. I'm glad he'd made that movie. It was good. I, I can't wait to see it. I've, it's a great movie. Uh, the first uh, Chicano Marvel superhero and um, just yeah, a beautiful amazing. story. And and the women, uh, as we like to say in Spanish, are true chingonas as well. So chingonas, right? <laughs> we <love them. laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I want to see it. I think I have time to ask you about, you know, Jeopardy, because you were the okay. first celebrity Jeopardy champion. Um, when you got word that you were going to be on Jeopardy, did you just show up? Did you prepare in advance? Uh, I'd been preparing for that show for all my life, to <laughs> tell you the truth. I mean, my cousins and I used to play some form of Jeopardy amongst us all the time. All yeah. the time we'd get assigned. Like it, we used to, there was this program called the College Bowl. And when I was younger and, and it was all these colleges competing against each other in, in a, in a kind of, you know, uh, academic situation, you know, and we used to watch that religiously. And so we used to play it. My, my, my cousin Louie would then again assign us, okay, you're all oh, Regine, you're Ohio state, Lolly, you're Southern California and Cheech, you're uh, Gallaudet. Gallaudet, what? it's a school for the deaf. Okay, well, you better brush up on your sign language, man, because we're we're going for that. And so we used to play those games all the time, and we drilled each other all the time. And then so when I was when I first heard that they were going to do a celebrity Jeopardy, I was on set doing Golden Palace with Betty Betty White, who was my idol, and and she said because she knew the people, she knew Merv Griffin, which we did too, but. She had knew him a lot better, and she said they're doing this. And he 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 selected all the character, all the contestants individually, rep, you know, passed on them or approved them. And uh, and I said, well, put my name in because he knows me, you know. And, and he did, and he said, okay, well, this should be interesting. And um, luckily, I won. Well, and that was like, that was a great, but I really seem like was a great it was moment. Luck. It sounds like you, you know, you prepared your entire life. Um, you know, I I did watch that clip because you beat Anderson Cooper from CNN. I think he was pretty salty about the fact that um, he lost and that he lost to you. To me, <laughs> <laughs> he was shocked. I mean, he's become a good friend since he calls me all the time. And if there's something relevant on his newscast, he calls me up to get my observation. But he he came in in between shows, you know, in the teen games, and he looked like he, he was shocked. He was walking around. He was and I was he was getting a shellacking in there, which is you know, hey man, you got to take your lumps sometime. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but he but he, he began to gain a whole new respect uh, for the Chicano community, which I represented. But it was it was like right. what a dream of a lifetime to win Jeopardy. Are you kidding, man? I just, I I would rather do that than you know win the presidential election. What? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, because you can have all the PhDs, huh? 
No, I was just going to say, you definitely made all of us proud. You certainly represented not just on Jeopardy, Cheech. I mean, uh, you represented, you have always represented the Chicano oh, community you. with so much grace and love and appreciation and thank you. Um, humor. And it has been um, such an honor to to watch you. So I'm, I'm so glad that you beat him. I also uh, saw that clip where he thought that it like, I think he asked you, did you practice pushing the button, right? And you had a technique. Can you tell yeah. the audience, like, you studied hard, but you also have to, like, buzz in first. That's, the, you know, the people don't realize. I mean, you can know all the answers, but if you don't know them first, you never get to say them. So it's <laughs> like, you know, you can look like a dummy, but you might be the smartest guy, you're, but you're the slowest guy, you know, and that's part of it. But when I was in high school and I, I was I was help, helping the track coach one day, time timers as they were coming in, you know, I think it was for hurdles or something like that. And I see, you know, regular guy with a stopwatch with a thumb on the thing. And, and he goes, no, you don't do it that way. You do it with your index finger because the index finger is much quicker reaction time. Well, how much difference can it make? You know, well, it makes a lot of difference. It makes a lot. And, and I never shared that technique with anybody until Anderson uh, asked me about it. Well, okay. You know, um, I showed him and then and, and it really made a difference, you know, because it's it's microseconds. Yeah. And I think he said that he was thinking about switching from the thumb to the index finger, but decided that maybe he shouldn't mid show. Right. Yeah. I, that's a good strategy. I mean, no, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's good. I mean, you don't, don't switch horses in the middle of a stream, you know, it, it comes from that, but it was like, yeah, I, you know, it's, 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 it's so, and so the writers after, after one, the writers of the show came up to me and says, are you a musician? And I go, yeah, all my life. He says, we thought so. So why do you think so? It's because your timing, you know, it's because the, the way it goes is, uh, is uh, 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 what's his name? The, the original, Alex Trebek. Alex says the question and then two, the light, then two lights go on on either side of the board. And then you can come in. If you come in before your buzzer shuts down for a second and a half and um, you're out of the contest. Yeah. Yeah. Timing so. experience. Um, I love how uh, what what a full circle that so many of your experiences early on informed the major victories and choices and success uh, that you have had isn't it in life. Right? I mean, you know, I mean, you could have all the PhDs in the world you want, but you win Jeopardy, and you're the smartest guy that ever lived. You know, I got <laughs> all your friends there, and I really am proud of that. You know, so and everybody recognizes it wherever I go, but like, because it's a because you can look like an idiot in there, you know, and, and which some of them did. Well, Cheech, uh, you have made our community proud. Thank you very um, much. What an honor to to spend this hour with you. I think we all learned so many new things about uh, your extensive career. Thank you for bringing the Cheech to Southern California and to Riverside. Um, thank you for always, you know, uh, lifting up the best in our community and for thank being you. a proud uh, Chicano. Uh, thank you yeah. so much for talking thank with us tonight. You know, it all comes full circle, you know, but the, uh, the reason the museum and the collection exists in Riverside today is because the Chicano community has supported me in everything I've ever done all my life. This is my gift back to the community. Well, on that note, to our audience, I want to thank you all for joining us. Please watch your inboxes for a link to this uh, recording. Share it with your friends who couldn't watch it. Um, and please, please um, watch future invitations. Um, on November 8th at 6 p.m., we'll welcome Matika Wilbur to the Calendow Live virtual stage. Matika is a visual storyteller from the Swinomish and uh, Tlaib peoples of the Pacific Northwest. And she'll be joining us to discuss her work, changing the way we see Native America. We'll see you there. Good night, everyone. Good night, Cheech. Thank you very much, Michelle. It was an honor. The honor was mine. <laughs> we'll see you next time. <laughs>